Hello and welcome everybody to Sonic Talk episode 497 recording today Wednesday the 28th of June uh, 2017. We are a podcast that talks all about music technology, uh, controllerism, software, recording, live production, anything to do with the surrounding kind of industry and matters to do with music technology, basically. Uh, did I say that already? I think I did. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube. Uh, YouTubesonicstate.com is our channel. Uh, please do subscribe. We're always looking for new people. We don't just do this podcast. We have reviews, interviews, all kinds of stuff, and uh, we have plenty of stuff planned for the future. I want to say uh, welcome to our sponsors, who will be giving away a copy of Isotopes RX6, which is the kind of de facto standard sound uh, audio restoration suite of plugins does a lot of great things so if you stay tuned about halfway through so probably about half an hour or so there will be a competition and you'll find out if you enter maybe last week's competition whether or not you won we want to say thank you to them we want to say also hello to our youtube chatties i managed to figure out a way to get the uh, youtube chat in there can't merge them yet and also this is the live stream on youtube and also we've got our own irc channel uh, where you can see everybody there that's at sonicstate.com forward slash live um yeah, and it's much nicer this week. Last week was so, 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 so hot and half the equipment started breaking and it was all very stressful and just a bit too sweaty. Not so much this week, so uh, very pleased. I'd like to start off, actually, because... Uh uh, Brighton Modular Meet is this weekend in the UK. If you're in the UK, Whoa. Saturday and Sunday, uh, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday, and then, uh, sorry, 11 till midnight, actually, and then on Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, it's at the Attenborough Art Centre, University of Sussex in Brighton. So head on down there. Uh, you can find it at brightonmodularmeet.co.uk, find that information. I don't know if you need to buy tickets or not. You may do, but uh, I'm sure you can find out that stuff for yourself. Anyway, that was Gaz Williams, we heard, <laughs> ooing and ahhing in the back. And he, is, he is our only guest this week, which is a testament to how busy everybody is. And I know you <laughs> usually are. Uh, not that you're uh, slacking, I'm sure, in any way. Gaz Williams, of course, professional bass player, producer. Uh, you're working on an album at the moment. You said you just did a, a vocal take just before this, which was uh, hence some funny business with the uh, the sample right on your audio interface. And uh, gazwilliams.me is where you can find them. How are you, Gaz? Yeah, really good. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's more sporadic for me to join the show over the summer we've got a lot of things coming up now uh, as well um but uh yeah just um loving loving the creative process once again it just been inspiring the hell out of me and just you know guys we're doing the right thing playing music you know you're definitely and you're in the right place right now at sonic state because we you know we get to have fully indulgent conversations. That's about right. This, There's about... no guilt. It's a guilt-free tech zone. <laughs> guilt-free tech zone. Come on. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. But Gaz, it's lovely to have you. And I know uh, there was been a lot going on. No. Uh, well, anyway, let's let's start. Um, well, actually, no, we've got, there's only two of us. What have you been up to then? Who are you recording? Can you talk about it? Uh, yes. Um, well, I have, I have mentioned it before because it is this Asteroid Deluxe album called, ah, the, yes. La called the Lawn. But you see, we've kind of hit a bit of a hurdle now, and it's really bizarre, and it's quite tragic as well, because we've made this concept album about the tower blocks in Britain and how they haven't been sort of looked after. Oh. It's a whole concept album. It's called The Lawn. The Lawn is the first tower block that was built in Britain, in Harlow, 1950. And we've done this, and we've used uh, this idea of the architectural vision of these places, you know, because people coming out of the tenement slums and that sort of thing were kind of being offered this real futuristic vision and this this kind of, you know, these tower, uh, you know, flats in the sky because they all have big windows, central heating, indoor toilets and stuff. So the idea, there was a certain noble aspect of it. And then, so we've just, but then it. So you've run uh, with it and uh, our events have kind of. So we've done it. Yeah. So I'm just trying to justify it's not such a pretentious idea. There's a lot of musical things to investigate with this and sort of the subsequent decline. And now the awful tragedy at Grenfell Towers happened. And we actually don't know what to do about this because we've got, a, we're debuting it at the Green Man Festival and we've got a film like being commissioned of uh, essentially st images to do with the concept. But. It's it's funny, isn't it? Because our this creative process now, this horrible disaster that's happened, is kind of uh, well, it will like, influence how people will, uh, I, I guess. Uh, but we take have, the concept out of context, right? <sighs> but, uh, but then it's also kind of relevant as well. It's so zeitgeisty relevant. I'm just a bit done in about whether it's 
you know, whether we should, what we should do about it, really. You know, it's August. We were going to launch it in August. Um, and I, I should mention, it's like a, it's like a prog, it's like a proggy, it's like a Pink Floyd album. It's all interconnected pieces. It's beautiful. I'm so proud of it. It's one of the best things I've ever worked on. So I'm very excited about it. But, but, and now I'm into balance this what to do with it because of the you know yeah well if, it's it's events. really interesting that i mean i've seen the, a, a similar note i mean, i remember uh, when i was working with Goldfrap, um alison she did a, a a song called pilots which is a beautiful song and she you know she she tends to kind of go for the kind of look of uh, things and she had this kind of pilots hat and a uniform and looked great and it was a really beautiful concept but and obviously that was back at sort of 911 time and that oh. suddenly it became it became a sort of an impossible image to to use, just purely because I and mean, you know it wasn't like there was any intent behind it. It's just this awful kind of uh, set of circumstances. I'm sure it's possible, Gaz, to to do it the way that you need, but I guess you just have to contextualize it and maybe kind of make some form of public announcement whereby you say, you know, I don't know, kind of what if there's any support you can offer to the victim. I don't know. It's it's difficult though, very difficult, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's but you know, I mean, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Just from the well, not a funny thing. The thing is horrible. What's happened, but just the 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 thing about uh the creative process being uh i don't know why we chose that as a concept you know it just it a bunch of ideas came together and and then it just started to coalesce into something so uh well there's a lot of material to work with there i'd imagine really isn't there yeah but you feel very prescient as well prescient as well because the lyrics are sort of talking about this impending doom in and some of the characters that we've got in the songs. Uh, wow, so, that's really yeah, yeah, difficult, difficult. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you can find a way around it. Well, I I, hope, I wish you well through that particular um, maze of uh, complication, but I hope it all works out for you, and I can't wait to hear it myself. Right. Um, I guess we should do uh, a topic. Oh yeah, here's one. <laughs> So this is one of the videos by uh, Jean-Baptiste Artus, a series of them, Beat Step Pro Firmware 2.0. I mean, this thing's been out for two years, so patent chaining has been around for a while, but now they've uh, created scenes which allows you to store and recall those patent chains, which was not, it was always something that was just mercurial and you just did it on the fly and that was it, yeah. it was gone. So now you can kind of get it right uh, rather than get it wrong on the day. I won't play it all. I mean, you know, it, it goes through that. And there's a series of five or six videos which explains a number of the uh, BeatStep Pro uh, updates, which is actually, there's there's quite a lot of stuff. I, I haven't jumped yet because my, I stopped at Arteria. Uh, actually, well, before we go there, actually, one thing I would like to say is well done, Arteria, because, I mean, this is a, tw what, two and a half, three-year-old product. And they're still bringing out and listening. You know, I mean, yes, there are ebbs and flows. People have been clamoring for some things, not getting them yet. But now they, uh, mm. version 2.0, they've introduced a whole bunch of things. And it, it really does kind of almost lend a new lease of life to this hardware. And, you know, the thing about the BeatStep Pro is I see it in a lot of studios where people just use it purely as a MIDI to CV converter. They don't bother with any of the sequencing. They just literally have it there to convert to channels and trigs and what have you. But as well as that, it's I mean, I, I use it in my live performance setup uh, as, you know, as it is. And I stopped at uh, 1.2.6, I think, because there was an upgrade which changed the stability of the velocity track uh, and the... The, the consistency of the trigger outputs, which for me was difficult because I'm using the trigger outputs to trigger uh, Volker Sync uh, because I'm using beat divisions and the velocity I was using to run another oscillator and tune that, which was a bit hit or miss. It's not scaled properly. So it's not really intended for purpose, but I stopped there because it didn't work in the way that it had. So I don't know, Gaz, I'm guessing, I mean, you're a BeatStep Pro fan, you know, you, you dig it, you got it sort of almost as soon as it came out and I'm guessing by your email that, I, that you you you're all over this, right? I think it's a major major improvement on the product. I have been a little bit disappointed with it up until now. The BeatStep Pro, uh, when it was first announced, I got very excited about it because I love little hardware sequences, and I've got a bunch of them, and I find them a lot of fun. But the um, actually, I can show you. I can show you my little setup here. Um, if I just flip this around. This is one we advantage. are truly mobile. I can't, yeah. Uh, okay, so I've got BeatStep Pro there, and it's um, 
it's feeding the Erebus and the rocket, but also driving this uh, DRM drum machine. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically how how that set up with my with my getup here. Um, but the key the key one there though is is the DRM. The DRM is uh, a really it's just a really cool little drum machine, uh, drum synthesizer. So essentially using it as the brain for the DRM, because the DRM doesn't have any sequencer functionality. So. Right. So you just got it. As mm-hmm. a, yeah. So sorry, I've got around the house to explain that a little bit, uh, literally. <laughs> so using trigger inputs to trigger the DRM? No, using no MIDI. Oh, you use a MIDI, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's better with MIDI because it's velocity sensitive. And there uh, is one yes. of the main issues uh, that's really good about the BeatStep Pro. The uh, the little scrolly roller thing lets you do um, beat repeat, but it's the combination of ha- actually having the pressure sensitivity of the pads on the, be- the BeatStep Pro. You can do drum fills uh, where you vary the pressure, and you keep, and then you can with your left finger you can flick. Ah, between. because it's per pad beat repeat now, right? Yes. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well. Yeah. You just yeah, like pressure, and. Whatever pads you're holding down will repeat, but um, yeah, you're right. As opposed to doing it over the whole track, it's a switchable thing now. This is something that uh, machine has always been really good for. You see, so you can put fills in by literally you're pressing the whole the pad all the time, rather than playing the pad. You're actually just applying pressure, and then you use your body or whatever, and you put groove into the velocity. Right. So it's sort of changing it from a sort of tappy kind of expression more to a sort of a, a, a sort of. So the fact that you can do that now in the drum sequencer and record the output as well. So if you set the out, if you set the, if you set it to be thirty two, uh, uh, thirty two steps in the sequence, um, or sorry, thirty second notes really. Uh, you can do some really fantastic fills by sliding your finger between the the different time scales on the left. And it's a really cool thing. And, and I'm mentioning it in detail just to sort of stress a certain point. What this version two has done is it's really up the instrument aspect of the BeatSet Pro, I think. I think yeah, because you can now, uh, one of the features is you can now use the roller as an arpeggiator as well and that's that can right. record that yeah. output so you could play three notes on it and just kind of go and it'll record that into the pattern so it's it's a kind of as well as a, a fill based thing it's also a yeah. creative based thing right yeah yeah and it is interesting it definitely is interesting because a good thing with these kind of sequences for you know is the fact that you overwriting all the time is the steps you're not it's not building layers it's a monophonic sequencer yeah. i mean I'd have, I'd have loved to have seen them apply a polyphonic you know, a way of just putting whole chords in. I don't see why not, because you can also now... Well, only over MIDI, because CV wouldn't work, obviously. Oh, yes, of course. I mean as a MIDI. Sorry, you you, you use it a lot with CV, don't you? I, I use CV, it, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's like a MIDI thing. But the other thing which I'm absolutely delighted about with the update is that it now supports the Volker kind of sync out. Now, that's good for me, because I've got um, a Korg SQ1 sequencer. So that now can take the clock out from the BeatStep Pro and is that's improved that setup for me immeasurably. But uh, just to mention, I'm also running a key step on that system over there as well. And the key step is getting its timing information from the clock out of the BeatStep Pro 2. And I'm just using a headphone divider coming out of the BeatStep Pro to send the clock outwards and it's one of them five way ones and we've done it haven't we nick we did yeah. experiments with that you can it's surprising you can drive quite a few units it is i've been i, I i've been using the same thing and because on my system um you can only the way that the splitter works is i can only send midi clock to everything or nothing right so what i've done is i've taken the uh midi clock uh output and mm-hmm. split that and one goes to the uh uh, if I remember, no, uh, the the MIDI output one goes to the mm-hmm. uh, input of my MIDI switcher, and the other one goes directly into the Moog. So mm-hmm. it gets so I can drive uh, the sequencer and arpeggiator 
uh, and LFO rates directly. And I'm just using a simple kind of Y split for on the MIDI because you use mm -hmm. uh, some, th these guys, obviously. I mean, this is this is one from the, the they've got yellow ones mm -hmm. now for the Novation. So you split, do a headphone split for like this because these are stereo. And then you can just send MIDI into two destinations. It, it doesn't work mm -hmm. the other. You can't merge, but you can split. And that's really handy. I mean, and I guess that's the, that, that's one thing. That you, the one thing that I will say, the the other thing, as well as this pattern chaining thing, the other thing that's perhaps not so, uh, it's a shame that they didn't do, is to allow you to attenuate the trigger outputs. Uh, you can attenuate the velocity. They, they, they've added this ability to attenuate mm -hmm. the velocity CV output so you mm -hmm. can get it, scale it a bit more usefully for other f uh, features. But if you could attenuate the trigger outputs, because at the moment I use a trigger output to drive the Volker, uh, well, the, the, the Minilog sequencer, mm -hmm. because my BeatStep Pro might be running at, say, 120 BPM, but I might want to divide the clock down to 60 or 40 or whatever by using the beat divisions on the... Uh, and then that means I can run more steps on my 16 steps of Minilog. Yeah, I nice. don't uh, rather than kind of adjusting the actual mm -hmm. clock division in the Minilog settings. It means I can mm -hmm. just quickly kind of here's a new project. It's running the mm -hmm. sequencer. The sequence is going one, two, three, four. The Minilog sequence is going one, two. You know, and that is really useful. But I need an attenuator cable to do that. And sometimes mm -hmm. when I'm playing live, if the little slider on the attenuator cable has been knocked. Mm. It, it just drops out and starts oh, playing no. weirdly. Yeah. So it's not perfect, but it's still mm -hmm. pretty good. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, big thumbs up, I think, to Arturia for doing this. But I think also uh, it it has to be said, it has become a bit of a standard, hasn't it? A modern standard, the Beatstep Pro. Yeah, I, I would say so. I see them. They've, they've obviously done extremely well for Arturia, and I've seen them all over the place. And so many of my friends who've got similar setups uh are um yeah have have them so 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 i think this is cool and uh yeah and we could go on because there's a whole bunch of other things that they've put okay top, so the, the big ones are for you I, I don't know if pattern chaining is a big thing for you but it will be for a lot of people yeah the pattern chaining is huge because uh in a way it uses a similar process to machine you know machine uses this same idea of creating scenes well i suppose ableton live does as well to a certain degree but it's more i think uh this you know a scene is any group of patterns and any uh, in any order, and that's across all of the three different se sequences. So essentially, it's like um, a top level thing. Um, so it means as a jammable. Oh yeah, and you can change. You say I have three times round pattern one. Yeah. Twice round pattern two, once yeah. round pattern three, and that yeah. will store. Remember that. Uh, yeah, that and sequence got, of events effectively. That's right, and you've got sixteen of those, but you can jump immediately between those arrangements, you know, or you can set it to change at the end of the pattern now, and that's like toggleable. So, if you want the pattern to play all the way through before it moves on to the next pattern that you've uh, to the next scene rather. Yeah. So, so being able to jam at that level, at the top level, with pattern chains across all of the different sequences i think it makes it you know it uh exponentially better for uh a more sort of um you know for when you want to kind of get down to a more macro programming -y yeah i mean one thing that i, uh, that I just quickly pr point out uh, another couple of things uh, one thing also is on the uh, in in the beats mode uh, the drum sequencer it used to be a global MIDI channel. Now you can set each individual one as a separate MIDI channel, which is actually very useful, certainly for live, if you want to trigger certain things or samples or notes on certain things. That's really useful. Uh, one thing I would like to have seen is receiving program changes on global channels so you could automatically select a project. You know, if you've got a button that you press, in, indeed I have in my case, uh, I press a button and it recalls program changes from everything it does have some sort of scene recall via program changes, that would be useful. That's not there, but, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, oh, yes, yeah, so now you can, you know, which I was really surprised you couldn't do originally, which is, like, press a, a note on the one of the pads, which is representing a note in a melodic sequence of part, and then hit a step, uh, which is the way you do it on Electron devices. Um, you couldn't do that on BeatStep Pro, but you can now with version 2. So basic you know and that's why it, it sort of goes ah oh, if you could do chords it'd be so cool because you know like you can do that on like the electron you hold a cluster of chords on electron four for instance and then you tap on which steps you want that to be on come up with another chord tap on the steps you want that to be on so uh 
it would be perfect on the VeatStep Pro. So I just don't know why. Oh, maybe it's because of the CV issue. Maybe, but, maybe so, yeah. Yeah, but that's what I'd like to see. Other than that, it's pretty complete now. Anyway, it's a free download. You uh, do it via the MIDI, MIDI uh, command center, I think the software's called. It will update the firmware. Obviously, try and make sure you've got a copy of your previous firmware in case it doesn't work out, as with all of these things, because you won't want to end up in a situation where it's like, oh, it doesn't work and I can't get back to how it did. You know, be careful and all of those things. Anyway, that's uh, that's the BeatStep Pro uh, update, which I, I know we spent a bit of time on it, but it is, you know, like we say, it's kind of a ubiquitous thing, so it is kind of everywhere. Why don't we uh, now have a, a word from Isotope, who are our mm -hmm. sponsors. Got a new video. This is RX6. which has a whole bunch of new modules, particularly for the musician. There's the standard edition, which has uh, de-essing, de-breathing, uh, de-plosive, uh, ground hum removal, lots and lots of different modules, really, really useful uh, for sort of musical applications as well as if you need them for post. I mean, I use it quite a lot in video. Dialogue denoise being a good one when people mumble and they're a bit quiet. Vocal clip, breath control, very useful again in, uh, in terms of deep plosing, oh gosh, I can't read them fast enough. It's a new video I'm not familiar with, but honestly, if you need to fix your audio on a regular basis, this is something that's well worth checking out. There's all the modules there. And as with all of the uh, Isotope stuff, you could download a free demo. Uh, Isotope.com forward slash RX6 should do it. So once again, we thank them for their sponsorship of the show. And um, we should say that we have a winner from last week. And I don't recall if this guy has actually ever won. I see him regularly. This is DSL Synth. Ha was the winner from last week. Uh, he tweeted... Uh, uh, Isotope Inc. got an audio, an ultimate audio fixer so awesome it can even solve your noisy neighbour problems. There you go. So he was a bit creative with that and he got picked out by the supercomputer. Uh, so if you get in touch, then uh, we can get the Isotope people to drop a full copy of RX6 into your account. And of course, we've also got uh, a competition for this week. Uh, if we just go here, we're looking for, I, I, I got a bit creative this time. So if you want to enter the competition, what you have to do is you have to tw use Twitter is the way that we do it. So we're looking for the Hashtag depop de hum. So, as you would expect it, that's one word depop de hum. Uh, and also, we're looking for the hashtag RX6 and you tweet them to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. So, if you're on the screen, you can see the video version of this. Tweet the hashtag depop de hum and the hashtag RX6 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And that will enter you for the competition. And then uh, you may well be the lucky recipient of the prize next week. Once again, we do thank Isotope for their uh, support of the show. It's very much appreciated. Okay, then. Of course, that was... Uh, what do we got next? I, 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 I'm going to ask you what you'd like to do next because we probably won't get through all of them. So have you got anything specifically that you'd like to look at, Gaz? I, out, the, out the show notes? Yeah. Um... The Ableton skin thing is got a bit. It's reasonably interesting. Okay uh, then. So this was on uh, basically on uh, CDM Link, which is Peter Kern's mm -hmm. excellent uh, music technology blog. Uh, this is a chap called uh, Ninad Milosevic. I hope I've pronounced that right. And he basically has uh, come up. He's a, he's an interface designer. He wants a job at, at uh, Ableton. So, you know, there's no real kind of, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no denying it. There's a motive behind it. But he just took it on himself to have a go at redesigning Ableton's live interface, a sort of darker version. And he took a bit of a, a, a poll and also just sort of said, well, you say you might want this, but actually uh, he's done it very scientifically and then kind of like worked on it in a real right and proper way. I'm guessing this is, is sort of like a job application. But the main thing is, what's really interesting is that he's taken it upon himself to make this. I mean, you can't download this anywhere. It's all just mm -hmm. a kind of a look, but it's an interesting idea. And I and I, I mean, I feel the same way about some of the live thing. I'm, I don't mind so much about the dark thing, but that could work. What I want to see is a blooming big bar counter <laughs> that's just so tiny particularly if you're live mm. and you can't see where you are i just think that's one thing but it's really interesting idea because i know robbie bronneman mm. um, he reskinned his version of logic uh using resource editor which you can on some apps you can actually go in and kind of mm -hmm. change some of those things with a with a kind of uh, a code editor uh mm -hmm. you need to be kind of fairly careful obviously make a copy but i, I wonder if that sort of thing's possible i mean is that mm. what do you think about this it's kind of an interesting idea right yeah, it's an interesting idea relating to Ableton Live. I mean, you know, I'm sure Reaper users will just sort of be having a chortle about this because, you know, Reaper is eminently 
reskinnable and you can just change such a lot around on it and, and a lot of people do and there's absolutely thousands of complete different reimaginings of that piece of software and in fact you can get it so it almost looks like Ableton Live or it looks like Logic or it looks like Cubase and you know but so I only mentioned that just as kind of uh, a, as a context thing it's slightly slightly different point but um the this is interesting i think it's really interesting because um when ableton live first came out as i'm sure many of you can remember it was remarkable in its minimalism and that's yeah. what, that's what attracted me into it and it, and they've always maintained this very crisp and clean kind of look so when i saw this for instance i I just didn't like it. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, that's familiarity as well. I know what you mean. Yeah, it is familiarity. But also, I can understand if you were using it as your primary door, how you would want to sort of make things better from a workflow point of view and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the crisp, that crisp minimalism of Ableton has always been its real big appeal for me, that aspect of it. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, when I saw this, I was a bit like, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been getting into Ableton a little bit more recently, um, just purely because of you cool. know, developing uh, the uh, Wave Junction synth, which uh, there will be an oh, ad, yeah. ad later on, folks. Uh, uh -huh. But also, we've just shot a whole series of like eight videos with a guy called Tom Lonsborough, who is an Ableton certified trainer. And he came down and he plays live and he brought his live rig and his laptop mm -hmm. and sort of showed us how he'd set it all up, but, but then proceeded to give us a series of videos which are tips and tricks on how to kind of prepare for a live play out scenario, you know, disaster recovery, you know, how to use dummy clips, all of this kind of stuff. And it was really fascinating. And I've learned so much wow. from editing that stuff. And I'm really looking mm. forward to that. So, But there are still a few things that annoy me the hell out of me. Like, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. macros. Why do all macros have to be knobs? Why can't we have some macros, a macro type that's a button on mm -hmm. or off or a three state thing? Things like that just seem kind of really irritatingly kind of unnecessarily not right to mm. me and I'd like to be able to see that kind of so you know there's there's a mm. lot of way but but as we talked about before you know the problem is is things get bloated DAWs because they have to mm -hmm. be backwardly compatible and all of those things so you mm -hmm. end up in this awful cycle I know, I know there's rumours you know Ableton 10 is supposedly in development and is still not there yet you know so they're obviously wrestling with these very mm. issues I'd imagine and also you know snapping at the heels is the venerable bitwig you yeah. know which is just getting better and more impressive with every new iteration of it and the uh, uh my original review of it version one a, a way back now but um was kind of going "Woo, this is looking good but it isn't quite there yet but you know it is getting really good now so i think yeah. so version 10 is going to be sorry move the conversation on a little bit to no no sure version Carry 10 on. But we have talked about this before, and this is this thing that, you know, I, I, I've been uh, an avid follower and, um, of Ableton since version, well, version two, really. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's, version, it's interesting because the yeah. one thing that I've also been doing, and this is the case, I mean, I, I interviewed you know various people who use Live as their main mm -hmm. creative tool. And the thing I find very frustrating coming from a logic background and a, you know, or a Cubase, any of those things, working in an arranged format where you've got the timeline, the tools for editing in that environment where people quite often are constructing their arrangement before they then group it up and turn it into scenes is really very low. It's not properly featured you know things like marquees and something you know, that whole business of selecting moving around is really quite cumbersome and that's the thing that i think bitwig has the uh has the handle on because it mm -hmm. works it, it works you've got the non-linear kind of timeline version but then you can combine that with clips and i think that's the one that the one area where ableton probably needs some tlc mm -hmm. because then people who are working in that kind of uh writing scenario but they're not doing it on clip base they're recording a vocal along the timeline and then they're you know they're doing all of that will mm -hmm. enable them to uh, be more productive i would assume and be, and, and be able to kind of work in better ways even though you know yeah. they're going to be very very used to their particular ways of working mm -hmm. and what have you i always thought though there could be a way of doing clips which you could do uh audio clips with um takes stack takes but that kind of stay within the context of a clip and there's no way of doing that in Ableton as of yet, you know. So, you know, if you work with a lot of vocals and do or all, ah, right, with, yes, like, yes, like working with lanes, you know, that's its biggest sort of failing, really, compared to uh, 
com- compared to the other DAWs, I think. Um, yeah, well, that's the other thing. I mean, certainly from a recording interface point of view, there are tools that you need to be able to kind of yeah, yeah. spin but around I mean, the chorus a bunch of times, go, I like that take, I like that take, marquee, I've, and then join it up and all of those things. You're right, yeah. So, And I think the Ableton has always been sort of, uh, it's it's been pulled in two directions, you know, sort of people trying to pull it more into a traditional door and sort of maybe a more DJ sort of orientated sort of direction. Uh, and I think it's always been interesting to see which way that they're going to, to lean. And I think it's lent more towards sort of DAW type of things um, uh, in recent years. So I'd be interested. I'm, I'm interested to see when 10 comes out. This is entirely speculative, isn't it? Because there's no, there's no. Message. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Who knows when <laughs> yeah. that is? You know, but we just... we've talked about that as well. I mean, Ableton came out every year, a new update every year, every year, every year, and more or less more for the first eight iterations. And then, it was on live eight for years. I mean, like four, year, four years maybe. And now it's been on live nine for four years, I think. It's yeah, like I that. suppose. So. I mean, and, and to be fair, mm. we have in the past bemoaned uh, Apple's logic kind of non, non rolling forward. I mean, they've, they've accelerated that a little bit and changed that in recent times, but there was a long period of time when it just yeah. did nothing and everybody was feeling like, mm. and I think they lost a lot of users because people were thinking, mm-hmm. oh, you know, maybe it's not going but it's, anywhere but it is interesting that ableton doesn't seem to need to re- like you know steinberg and other software um uh pro tools you know do iterative paid for upgrades and, vir- and it's like virtually yearly now with steinberg and if you are just going from the latest version up you know it's only around a sort of 50 quid sort of <laughs> and you always get like a big boost a big bump of uh loads of new stuff and i think that could work because some people moan Mm. about that but i mean you don't have to upgrade you can stay where you are that's fine but you know yeah so so it's interesting that ableton can kind of stick it out with only very few products that they make really you know the push and the and a few i think they've got such a massive user base i mean Mm. and and again i go back to the series we shot with tom some of the things that i was seeing him do is just like i had no idea you could do that at all Uh, i was just like that is mind with the Instrument racks, okay? Mm. Uh, I'll give you a pr- quick pre... Uh, uh, what he basically did was, uh, in an instrument... So his live keyboards go to just a single track, right? And he's got an instrument rack in there. But the, you can add lots and lots... You can add up to 128 state states of that. Sorry, somebody's ringing me. It's my <laughs> usual... It's my uh, afternoon spam call from the uh, wine merchant. So I don't know why they ring me. I bought something once for somebody for Christmas. Anyway, I digress. So you can have all these different states. So what you do is you create a rack and you put your keyboard splits and you put your, you know, you can have a rack within a rack. So you could have like, you know, left hand side might be playing out to a live instrument, which is coming back in via an audio input or playing an internal synth. That's one. And then the next step along would be a completely different set with multiple splits, up to 128 splits and layers. Mm. And what you do is you, when you change songs, you automate the playhead to go to the next iteration. So you never have to uh, record enable a different track to, to have your complete keyboard set up with however many instruments and plugins. And effect, it's it's just, I, it blew my mind that. And it's like, wow, I did not know that. Really clever. So anyway, I won't mm. go on about it. I'm hoping, because I've just sent all the videos to... Uh, to Ableton to have a look at. So if they come back and go, yeah, we don't like that one, then i kind of rather blown it, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick quickie on the nuisance calls thing. Um, a friend of mine said about his elderly parents are so fed up of uh, nuisance calls that they keep a sports whistle by the side of the phone. <laughs> and as soon as, they, as soon as it's one of these unsolicited... Uh, <laughs> That's extreme. They just blow the whistle. <laughs> wow. And I think it's... Uh, I think it's quite an interesting solution to that. You wouldn't want to get it wrong though, because it might be, you know, <laughs> your your friend or your uh, your family member ringing for assistance from because um, they've lost their phone. <laughs> I think it's those calls where they say, "Oh, your computer has got." Oh yeah, virus. yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Those kind of things, or oh, we've heard that you were involved in a car crash. <laughs> get a <the> whistle. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they ever call back if that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch, yeah. Or you wouldn't want that with a headset on, would you? That would be absolute <laughs> agony. Yeah, They're only doing their jobs, but yes. Yeah, I know, it's a bit me. Well, I don't know, it's, yeah, no. Anyway, they, right, they um, I'm gonna, I'm, with all this talk of Ableton, I'm now going to play uh, the second of our little uh, feature. This is Wave Junction. It's our Max for Live synth, which you can run in Ableton only at this point, I'm sorry to say. Uh, two oscillators, 
three filters which can be routed all over the place, all multi-mold filters, five LFOs, five ADSRs, a 12-slot modulation matrix, uh, wavetables on the oscillators as well. Really kind of quite a nice sounding little synth actually. You can buy that directly from us. Uh, bit.ly slash wave junction will get you there. And we've got a code uh, for 10% off which is running till the end of June which is in fact uh, WJ1706. So if you follow, if you go to bit.ly slash wave junction that'll take you to the page and then when you purchase you enter the code WJ1706 and that'll give you an additional 10% off of what's already hardly more than a round at a, your local pub for a couple of mates so <laughs> if you're into if you've got max for live and uh, you've got your wave uh, able to live then please do check it out it helps support the site but it's also a great thing too Ooh. uh right um do you want to do i'm glad it was glastonbury this weekend wasn't it now <laughs> I, neither of us went no but and wow. i was really hoping because rich hilton played he played oh uh, he played uh with Sheik on the main stage, which I think is the second Big, second yeah. time. Um, no, they haven't played on the pyramid. Though. Oh, they, have they I, not? No, they were there in 2013, and they played the Jazz World stage, which is now called West Holtz, but still the Jazz World for me. Um, and they that they headlined that stage, 2013. That's a big stage, but this time round, it was the pyramid stage, and was broadcast live on the telly. Uh, was a very high profile gig. I think um, it's been interesting, hasn't it? You know, because Rich has been on the show for a long, long time. And in that period, we've seen Sheik go through this renaissance. And it was just so glorious. There was loads of good close-ups of Rich as well. Yeah, Rich got, definitely got a few close-ups this time. <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah, yeah. There he is. I know him. <laughs> and also, you get to see just what an absolutely blazingly hot musician he is as well. You know? Well, at all, and all of them. I mean, all they, them, that ba- sure. it's interesting because yeah. I watched quite a lot of Glastonbury this year mm. uh, because I think the BBC coverage is just peerless. I've never seen anything done. You know, they, they are brilliant. I mean, obviously they miss a number of things, but it was absolutely brilliant. And um, I was watching it there and I just, they were, they were really on it. I've forgotten. Uh, Jerry, of- Jerry Barnes, the bass player, has sort of really made a big name for himself from that performance. So many of my friends on Facebook have just been, uh, you know, and non-bass players too. A lot of bass players have been really excited seeing that because he, he plays, you know, I was thinking about him there. I was thinking, car, oh, you know, Bernard Edwards is the master, isn't he? He's the greatest sort of pop bass line composer probably of all time. You know, those lines are, yeah, I would say that is, I would say he is. Uh, so those lines those lines are almost sacred, aren't they? I mean, you know, they are just those lines, you know, um, good times baseline is one of the absolute, you know, it was interesting when they did good times, didn't they? They went into uh, yeah, yeah, rappers, rappers delight, delight and uh, yeah. Blondie, Fab Five Freddy and uh, Niall actually did the rap, which was kind of cool. Yeah, it was really cool. But I I was just going to say about Jerry though, is that, you know, Jerry uh, has got those, you know, he's got big shoes to fill. You know, sa- you know, sadly, Bernard passed away, didn't he, about, well, nearly 20 years ago now. But, you know, he but he embellishes the lines with a real funky confidence and does different little things. And, you know, brilliant. How entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. Uh, there were a lot of other great acts. I mean, perhaps we can go into that in a sec. But um, I did ask Rich because I was hoping he was going to come on the show and he was. But he, uh, he was called away at the last minute. I don't think there's anything, you know serious but you know family commitment or whatever and uh, i said so because i was texting him after i said are you still there you know and that was great and he said how was the sound i said the sound was pretty good there was you know it was a bit up and down but generally i mean the band mm-hmm. was so and i said tell me do you get nervous i mean you i don't know how many people were there in the audience i would let's say huge Fifty thousand, a very conservative estimate. Plus, yeah, more seventy thousand for that i reckon plus the live audience mm. i said don't you oh, yeah. aren't you just terrified he said no you know and the reason is is because the band are so good and there's so Mm. much trust between everybody in the band that that Mm -hmm. nobody he doesn't get nervous at all he really is kind of like you know Mm -hmm. which uh, is astonishing really because i mean just looking out at that many people i can't Mm -hmm. imagine what it's like but the thing that got me as well i mean it it was there are usually a lot of really great performances glass to be this year it didn't seem like there were so many bands who were at that level where it all clicked and they just went bang and it was it became bigger than them you know there were there were there were a few but last time mm-hmm. i watched there was there seemed to be more where bands came out and i just wondered if there was anything particular that you uh i, I don't know if you saw any of it or whether there was anything particularly that you saw that you were surprised that i just thought wow they did a great job 
No, I, I've missed all of it. I only wanted to see Sheik, and I ended up as well seeing uh, Barry Gibb, actually. Yeah, that was, was one of those, I think. I, I, Love. I, I thought that was amazing, actually. Uh, and that was the only thing that was making me envious that I wasn't there. Uh, His band Gast- were amazing. Yeah, they really were. And also, you know, you just kind of just go, Barry Gibb is just, what a, an immense body of work that he's done. An incredible amount of songs and so many enormous hits for other people as well as for the Bee Gees. And, uh, you know, you're just kind of going, whoa. And then I had to have a little look into it. And uh, he is, after Paul McCartney, the second most successful songwriter in pop history. Wow, that's interesting. Mm. And, uh, you know, all of those hits. And still wow. singing falsetto, which was absolutely <laughs> my, I mean, yeah. not quite think, as sweetly as before, but still pretty damn A little impressive. Glastonbury thing kicked off there. There was a bunch of guys dressed as the Bee Gees with gold jackets, and they wanted him to wear his gold jacket. Just just people from the crowd. And a big crowd chant going like, uh, Barry, put the jacket on or something. You know? And he did, didn't he? he yeah, just passed it And forward. then the whole audience started singing it, so you could hear it. Huge audience. So we put it on and he wore it for the last 10 minutes of the show. It was tiny. Like, yeah. Tiny little gold <laughs> jacket. But I thought, you know, that is, that's how to, you know, that's how to engage with an audience. That is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very good. I, I would like to say uh, that was there a couple of other ones that I, that, that caught my mind. I also saw Golf Rap. They did it pretty well. Um, Alison was really, you know, giving quite a lot to the audience, which is, you know, not something she always does because she's no, a private right. person. She was really pushing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll tell you what, Lord was blew my mind i mean what she's 19 20 something like that and she was on the front of the stage playing I, th- I don't know if it was the main stage or the uh one of the other big ones but in front of a lot of people and she held the whole thing and she was so compelling to watch and that, that was really impressive uh, a couple of other ones uh the amazons sort of rock band who were playing in bristol in a couple of weeks they were really good All right. <laughs> foo fighters obviously did their rock thing but they're used to it they you know and uh, a band called metronomy who I thought were brilliant. If you get a chance to check them out, they were really good as well. I've got a, a, a girl drummer as well, um, which in itself is an unusual scenario. And she was really good. And just the whole thing was just really compelling sort of synth pop. And there's a lot of, there was quite a lot of synthesizer action there. In fact, uh, during Get Lucky in Chic, uh, I've forgotten the name of the night, the, the, I think it was called Russ, the keyboard player. He was playing going? a JDXI <laughs> as yeah, the vocoder, he- which was pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I covered that too. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but yeah, uh, good, good. I was, I was pleased that the festival, you know, went so smoothly, really, because it, it can be, because the weather was good. And uh, yes, well, there's that as well. There's a huge, huge effect. But uh, it's, did, not ha- I, it's not happening next year, though, Glastonbury. No, they it's have, a year off, have, isn't it? They have a year off every so often. Uh, interestingly, going back to the BBC stuff, uh, on. Uh, ProSign News Europe, which is psneurope.com. Big shout out to uh, Dave Robertson, who uh, left his 19, 18, 19 years with uh, ProSign News Europe. He's been a guest on this show. He left uh, last Friday. That was his last day. Um, uh, But there was an interview with a guy called Bob Shannon, who is from the BBC coverage. And apparently 20.9 million tuned in to watch the BBC's Glastonbury coverage this year. Uh, It's up by 12%. So, you know, they're obviously doing something right. Good. So anyway, cool. Uh, right. Um, what's the time? I did. I've done that ad, so that's all right. Um, maybe I'll save this one, uh, and we'll do um, this. Yeah, this. I, I think this is the right video. Let's see if it is. Ah, yes. <laughs> this is the Output Inc. platform, which is a kind of new. It's a studio desk that they've been designed specifically for musicians, and you know it's. A, uh, in its basic form, you can get, it looks like marine ply, lots and lots of kind of platforms and, and cable, keyboard tray, rack space, 9-inch rack space, cable, there's cable tidy management and all that sort of stuff. I think they start around 549 bucks. I'm guessing that's probably for the... Uh, um, for the plywood version, you get a variety of different finishes. And it just got me thinking, because uh, they, they actually write a really interesting blog on their site, which kind of says, well, you can go to Ikea, you get that, all, all of these things are possible, but we thought we'd do something of our own, and that's that's what we've gone for. And I just thought, is it possible, actually, to buy an off-the-shelf studio furniture type of thing? Because it's such a personal thing. In my opinion, you have to either design it or build it yourself for it to be truly valid. Hmm. I mean, straight away, you know, you look at this and I think, okay, that's pretty cool for those pieces of kit. Uh, But also, 
the dreaded GAS kicks in. Yeah. And then are you going to then be restricted to what you can have because of your, your fixed furniture? furniture? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> your furniture dictates what yeah, you can buy. I can imagine I can imagine some partners just buying them direct, you know, just so they to limit what you can do with Ah, them. you buy it as a gift and then that's yeah. sneaky. <laughs> that's a clever that's a clever fixed idea. amount of things. This is what you've got. Yeah. I was trying to explain this yesterday to somebody uh just about um this uncontrollable desire for more gear, just how you get loads of cool stuff, but it's well, I know different people. Have well, you've different... been pretty, uh, you've been pretty kind of uh, restrained. I mean, there was a time when, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that is true. But uh, look at this. You having look a new? Are you entering a new phase? Look what I got! Look what I got from a little secondhand shop on Sunday. It's a little Hammond X two. And it's on. It's got this chrome legs. Oh! And it's all got. Uh, and it's um, it's nice. It's got one of those pitch. It's got like a tuning knob. You could use it like a pitch wheel. <laughs> like is a it transistor bed. or has it got uh, copper uh, discs in no, it? No, it's a tran. It's a transistor one. I think these were actually the first ones of the Suzuki. I think it's, it's made in Japan. Ah. But it's quite nice because I got these pedals that were just sitting in in a cupboard, and that's a wicked. That's a that going through that lot is so entertaining it's just uh it's it's deeply fun um but that is a massive amount of floor space you've just uh, used up there guys no no it's not it's not that big because i mean like normally an organ well yeah it's a bit but (laughs) but but don't kid yourself i gotta say though i gotta say it just is amazing <laughs> well, and we've used it loads now on different. Uh, on well, different no, that's projects. fine if you're going to use it. I mean, I, I must admit, I think the idea of this because I, I actually uh, my live rig is, as you know, when we uh, we specified that you had to have a one meter by six hundred table, which is a kind of it has to fit in that space. It, well, obviously, Ty didn't do that for the gig we did last year, but that I've kept to that. So now I, anything I buy has to fit <laughs> into that, and I the the, the circuit fits in. Uh, I haven't got any more space though, so now I can't unless I replace something or swap it out. I can't change it over unless I start breaking my own rules. So the so the the furniture certainly for my live rig is definitely uh, uh, gu- so this, guided by the by the furniture I'm using. So this contraption that I've got here, I'll show you my contraption because it's I've made it out of bits. Um, this thing here. Uh, so there's that organ we we're just looking at, um, and this like like triangular tabletop. It was just free around the back of uh, IKEA. They they give out just you know you can just get pieces of. That's a good tip actually. Just at the back of IKEA, they just give out. They, there's a bit and there's just lots of boards and stuff. So that there it was like a big triangulary sort of semi triangular, um, and it kind of limits. Normally that space there is where the iPad that I'm holding sits, and then up on the top, there's. Ah, uh, yeah, but you see, uh, hold on, pan back a bit. Above the di- see, that's that's a home built extra bit. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, that that's sitting on. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be done. Yeah. yeah, and that's cool in this particular case though, because this is this DRM has got a left and right output on there, so the pan controls uh, I'm using in this case uh, is it's going in mono. It, it, one channel goes through the retroverb, and then the other channel goes direct. So the pan, the pan is now an effect send right. on this, and that thing's got a spring reverb and a LFO and uh, a, a really, really nice filter on there. So, and the other thing I've been doing, actually, this lead here is going into the Erebus. So with the Beatstep Pro, I've been putting patterns into the Erebus. Then that's getting the the clap from the. It's awesome. It's so good. It's so exciting. <laughs> and, you know, I love things like that. I hadn't done it before. I plugged it in, and then it was like, it was a face palm. It was like, it was so good. It sounded so good. Well, you're running the clap through the Erebus? Yeah. Ah, okay, got you. Yeah, using the clap through the Erebus. And, um, well, just switching the oscillators off. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, no, no. No. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm doing a busy pattern on the, um, 
I do the busy pattern on the BeatStep Pro and then playing with the release controls to dip in and out of it. So so it opens and closes the so it lets some claps through into loads That's of delay. That's a really interesting way of doing it. I, I don't know if you saw uh, Kumri Beats. Uh, we were talking to Martin Dubka, who we posted his final. I know Martin. So Martin uh, was, because uh, he signed to BMG, they'd said you can't mm-hmm. post this stuff publicly, but he had a word with them and they, they allowed us to do so. You can check hey. this out. It's very wobbly because there was so much bass in the room. It's kind of like the cameras are doing this the whole time. <laughs> but we think we fixed, a, we found a way to to get around that for the next time. He's but good, he, isn't he? what he does is he sequences the notes and the gates and the envelopes separately. So he plays a melodic line and then he'll just rhythmically open up the notes that he's playing rather than, which I think is a really interesting, hmm. which is similar to what you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I've got going on over there is I've got a, a drum trigger output coming from the beat step pro feeding the trigger input of the, uh, Vimona retroverb. So I can... Um, oh, well, so you can just make a splash? Yeah, well, it does all sorts of stuff. I, I've kind of got it doing... Um, so putting in patterns then into the BeatSet Pro, it's sending trigger patterns then, which you can then drive the LFO from on the uh, on the retroverb. And you can... So, so it's just kind of putting time elements in. Uh, so, you know, you've got... You can control a filter uh, or the VCA. Huh. There's so uh, many ways to do it, isn't there? I mean, yeah, that's the beauty sorry, of this yeah, stuff. Blah, blah, that blah, is, blah, blah. No, but that is the beauty of this kind of thing is, you know, you can yeah. often just kind of go, what happens if I... And then suddenly it's like getting a new piece of gear almost, isn't it? I know. But don't you find that it's like, but then if I had this as well... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I've got the Deep Mind 12 here, which is, I'm finding to be really, really cool and covers a lot of ground. And the gas that I've got, the insatiable gas that uh, needs to be cured. You know what it is, don't you? Uh, do I? Is sure the do. Dreadbox Abyss. Ah, yes. A wand! That thing has been designed for me and my MIDI bass. My MIDI oh, yeah, bass. you know, you've mentioned that before. That's right, because you can play Perfect. the address the notes in, uh, individually. It, yeah, but you know what? I mean, I've used the Erebus Live with the MIDI bass. And like that, you've noticed this. Those those no, those knobs are so clustered so tightly together that it's so easy to knock the master tuning. Yeah. And in a gig and uh, with a bottom end, you can't that, really tell, can you? Uh, yeah. It could be. It could be disastrous. It could be disastrous. I'll tell you what I did see. This was something that um, Ma, um, Ian Body had because he was playing an on the Martin uh, French Connection, which is an Analog Solutions controller. Mm. And what he had was uh, a tuner just on the top of the thing so he um this was just so he could pitch mm. properly so he could see you know where he was yeah, around yeah. the note nice. and i guess you could probably do the same thing with mm. the through well, on the erebus yeah well actually speaking about that i with the moog theremini the the kind of uh, digital theremin that they do the actual theremin aspect of it is an analog oscillator and it's got a cv out on it uh so you can run the cv out into say something like the uh um, the er- the Erebus. Yeah. This is quite good fun. You have to kind of keep the envelope open. That's the only difficulty, but that's okay. Just set a sequence. Just, I set a sequence just to leave it open. Uh, but it's got, the reason why I mention it, it's got a tuner on it. So you can play. Ah, so you can see what see, you're doing. You, and so as a theremin, it's, uh, it's actually really cool because you get, cause, you know, I appreciate that when you use the built-in engine in the Theramini, which is essentially the Animoog engine, it's it's great and it's fun, but it's not that electric sizzle that you want from a um, yeah. from a from a theremin. Uh, but it's only a CV out, so you don't get that lovely left hand stuff that you, you it doesn't affect the volume. So. Um, so I, I use a, a volume pedal with it. Yeah. And that going into the th- Erebus with the delay turned up on the Erebus makes the theremini with its tuner. So you can still use its, and you can still use its pitch rounding as well. So Ah, right. So you just tune that. Yeah. It that... beco- becomes like an immense theremin, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. whoa. Uh, Multi- a multi-theremin. Yeah. <laughs> so it's cool. Excellent. 
Well, uh, we seem to have managed to get to five o'clock and uh, we only covered a few topics, but that's the way of these things and that that's fine. I'm liking the freeform nature uh, of it. It's can all... we carry on talking for a few more hours, please? Uh, well, <laughs> it would normally be okay, but I have places to go and I'm sure you do too. You've probably got some stuff to do. I will say that I've got this uh, circuit mono station here. Yay! Which I was uh, messing around with. I, I, mm. I I was trying to see if, because it's paraphonic, I was seeing if I could use it to uh, essentially recreate some of the things that I use, like uh, I play paraphonically on the sub. So I tried this. And this is one of my tunes that I play. Oh, yeah. So I've got a square wave modulating the low oscillator and then playing the top note. I, I did it via a keyboard because it was easy. So, wow. anyway, so I did hey. get the opportunity to do that. So I, that I'm going to be reviewing cool. that quite soon, um, hopefully, because I've got to try and get it all in before I go away on holiday. Um, yes, I'm having two holidays this year. What a, what a thought. I don't, that, that's, I don't think that's happened for years. So um, that's coming up. Uh, we've got the Ableton cool. series coming up. Uh, we've got... Um, we've got the Tim Exile stuff coming Tim up. Tim Exile stuff coming up. Uh, we've got... Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff, more stuff coming out. And if you didn't check out the Cymru Beats, I, I have to say, uh, um, Simon Lewis from Cymru Beats, he put a really good bill together, even though I wasn't on it, obviously, because I'm not <laughs> modular enough. But there was a really great selection of people, and it was not just bleeps and blops. We had Mylon Melodies, Ian Body, and Nigel Milani. Uh, we had uh, Wisdom Water... We had John Bidolf and also Martin Dubka. And we've interviewed the, all of them about their rigs and then also posted all the live streams. So do check. I sent out a newsletter today. So if you want to check that, it's like 50, I don't know how many minutes. It's a lot of time because well it was like three, four hours of stuff. And that was all done in a day. And I just wanted to say what a brilliant lineup that uh, mm. Simon had put together. And it was a really good event as well. And the network held up so we could actually stream it. It was awesome. What was the attendance like there? Uh, a little light, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think we probably uh, quadrupled the audience with our live stream. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that's not always, you know, necessarily a thing. I, I think I think also, to be fair, it was probably one of the hottest days of <laughs> Saturday nights of the year. So, I mean, what would you do, given the opportunity to wander down and see a load of electronic music, music in a sweaty room or have a barbecue? And I think they suffered a little bit from that that kind of effect. So, you know, that's just the way it goes. But as I said, <laughs> don't forget, if you're into synth meets, there's the one in Brighton. Brighton Modular Meet is this weekend. I think I mentioned that before, but uh, there's the page. Mm. Uh, if you go to brightonmodularmeet.co.uk, you get all the information there. Saturday and Sunday, um, there's going to be quite, it's quite a big one. It's one of the bigger ones, and they've got all these people and a wow. AJH Simps, so you can check out AJH Simps. worth looking at if you want to see his uh, mini mod um, range, which is the sort of um, Moog module. Oh, yeah. Did you, oh, yeah. The, yeah. the, the Behringer Model D, uh, I, yeah. I'm guessing. I'm, we, this is weird, actually. Uh, Behringer mm. Model D. Uh, they announced, or it was re released on Sweetwater page, pre-order page, mm -hmm. at two nine nine, which is a hundred yeah. bucks cheaper. But funnily enough, um, I'm just trying to find because what actually happened was is so, since I posted that and since we went live, somebody posted something to say that. Uh, let me see if I can bring the page up. <clears throat> uh, let me see. Blah 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 blah. The Sweetwater pre-order page is it still there? They said it wasn't. Ooh, it's gone. So I don't, I don't know whether that was some kind of operator error or they got more than they could handle, so therefore mm -hmm. <laughs> they've sold out of pre-orders because they only know that they're getting a certain amount. But that was kind of interesting. Interesting response yeah. to perhaps the Roland thing, right? Well, it definitely seems like that, doesn't it? I mean, because uh, the Roland one just sort of trumped the Behringer one in virtually every area, really. Uh, and you just kind of thought, whoa. So even though there was going to be a $100 price difference... This being a two hundred dollar price difference is because uh, I think it's four nine nine, isn't it, for the Roland? Yeah. And then <clears throat> I think three nine nine was the projected price of the the Behringer D. Uh, so that being like two hundred dollars difference, and I guess that's going to translate similar in pounds here now. I think be about three hundred quid, you'd imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, people seem to forget because they all moan, "Oh, why is it not the same?" Because you have to add twenty percent VAT plus import mm -hmm. duty, so that roughly mm -hmm. takes it because of the strength of the dollar. Probably mm -hmm. takes it roughly to parity, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps even a bit more. In fact, right. Okay, so um, it's you know because the the Roland one has got a, some wicked tricks up its sleeve. I know you talked about it last week. Um, 
whereas the Behringer one has got a few tricks up its sleeve. It's got a lot more CV know. connectivity, to be has fair. Has it, though? I thought yeah. the... uh, No, no, it has, yeah. Uh, oh, right, okay. Uh, I'm just trying to find I thought it. it was similar. No, let me see. Uh, I don't think this is a big enough image, actually. Let and isn't the Behringer one Euro rackable? Yeah, I've got it here. We've got uh, CV uh, gate filter control. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot more CV, con- uh, LFO, out, LFO in, well, external a, inputs. There's a bunch of stuff, though, on the back of the Roland one, isn't there? Not that much. Oh, isn't there? No, there's. I think there's a bit of CV. There's CV and gate IO plus, mm-hmm. I think there's uh, maybe a, contr- a, f- a filter frequency IO mm-hmm. uh, input as well. So not quite the same. But yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. as we said before, you know, there was a big big hoo-ha because studio electronics make some great stuff and i i've put mm. in a request to get a cop get one down here as soon as possible so i, oh, I, I yeah, hopefully yeah. get to look at that well and it is interesting with you having the circuit uh mono what's the full name of it now the circuit mono circuit station. mono station the circuit mono station um and there's that one from uh Pi, uh what's the one the uh, with the dave smith uh hookup uh Oh, the, the uh, gosh. The Pioneer. Yes, I forgot. AS, uh, AS, AS, AS1. AS1, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so Plenty around, of mono sense around, aren't there? <laughs> yeah, around that 500 quid range with sequency sort of tricks, you know, sort of 303 or Moogie kind of things. Interesting. 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 Yeah, maybe yeah. there'll be a kind of, okay, we've had enough of this for a while. We need something what a bit different. I Who want. knows? What I want, and I think the only thing I'd, I'd be interested to see, because people keep going, get a Euro rack, get a Euro rack. There is something that I want, and I don't know if it exists yet, and that's like a little box about that sort of size that is a sampler and a granular sort of sampler, a little bit like a micro granny. I la- basically, I want a micro granny, but I want like a, a, a better micro granny. I can sort of do a bit of it in LP1, but I want to. Uh, um, Cloud, feed. doesn't Clouds do that? It does. But it's in Eurorack. Oh, you want it in? Okay, I am right. resisting Eurorack. I am resisting. We well, could always I'm... put it in a box. Just have a single purpose box. But that's the start, isn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, it, it, I, you know, people keep going on about it. You look at my little system over there, and it's all these little boxes linked together, and you know, it's. So... But you're almost there, guys. Oh God! If I got, sw- I, I would be swallowed. I would be swallowed up whole. I think if I did it. So, um, well, yeah. okay. Well, something to think about. Um, r- we should probably, uh, call it a day though, but I thank you ever so much for sticking with us, Gaz. And, uh, we managed to sneak <laughs> an extra 10 minutes in there without realizing it. So, Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's it for this week. I want to say thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Uh, well, for Gaz for joining us. And, uh, mm-hmm. also, uh, I want to say in case you missed earlier, uh, and you wanted to enter the isotope RX six competition, we're looking for the hashtag Depop Dehum. Uh, pretty much self-explanatory as one word and the hashtag RX6 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. If you enter that into Twitter as a tweet, we'll track them and then we get a random number generator from all the entries. And uh, congratulations to DSL Synth uh, for winning. If you get in touch, then we can get you sorted out. That's it for this time. See you next time.